it was like to start a podcast with like who I'm talking to. So what would you encapsulate what you do? Well, firstly, Ryan, I just want to thank you for inviting me here to talk to your listeners and, and your people. Um, my name is Matthew Gilligan. I'm a chartered accountant based in Newmarket in Auckland in New Zealand for the international listeners. Uh, and I guess you, I'm the MD and the founder of the business. Um, I started the business over 25 years ago. Uh, we now have around 110 full-time staff, yeah, it's crazy, um, yeah. and the business is run by my team. I've always had a principle of trying to hire people smarter than myself, because <laughs> uh, it means I don't have to be quite so smart. Yeah. Um, so I've got a, I've got a really good crew, and a lot of them are now buying into the business and, and gaining equity, hmm. and the the business is pretty much run under management of the very clever chartered accountants and lawyers that I have working for me now. So while I was founder, um, and it was a pretty tough start because I was, it started with me. I had to self train. Yeah. And um, I started the business at uni. Um, it's now now up there at 110, um, 40 on the floor in Newmarket, and I have a really good crew working for me. So the the business is, is different because we focus on property investment and property advisory, uh, and all the taxation advisory surrounding that. Um, we have lots of, of compliance, ordinary compliance clients that are gen, in general business. Uh, but what they like about dealing with us is they can say, hey, um, we want to create wealth. Um, what what can we do with you guys to get into the property market or what advice would you, you give us? And we can give them no end of advice, including workshops and one-to-one -one advice and access to mentors who we use affiliates to, to provide and all that stuff. So you know, our clients create money. Um, we help them minimise their tax, and then we take them down the property investment um, route. Hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I'll, I'll be curious, like, because they're going back to that uni point where you made the call. What made you decide? All right, I'm going out my own. Was it a boss that you didn't agree with? Was it like, oh no, nah, I just want to make something of myself? Or what was that? It was a while. Well, that's a good question, actually, because <laughs> you know, I was at uni, and my father, uh, who's a chartered accountant. Um, you know, conservative people, chartered accountants generally, um, with the exception of myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he told me that I needed to get a job and with a CA firm and they would teach me um, what it means to be a chartered accountant. And he said I needed to get, a, at the time, a big six firm, now a big four firm, and they needed to teach me. And that was the holy grail of being a chartered accountant. So that was ingrained in me, you know, buy a house, get a job in a big firm, learn how to be a chartered accountant and then you know i'll die happy um <laughs> and so by the end of uni i i actually had six staff working for me because i found i was naturally able to get clients and huh. um what was your natural first channel we like oh email calls door knock oh friends of friends this is pre-email <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah pre -internet, yeah. <laughs> this is like not this is like i don't know um 2004 you know oh. email's a new thing yeah. Um, I had a, a, a 386 um, computer, you know, oh, with a floppy drive. So it was, this is this is pre-internet. <laughs> and um, anyway, I um, got a bookkeeping service that I set up. And I went door knocking in Pukekohe because I lived <laughs> on a farm. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, do you want monthly accounts? I'll do your GST monthly accounts. And yeah, yeah. in a month, I got 120 grand worth of work uh, just crazy. by door knocking. Um, what, and, what do you find was quite useful with the door knock? Because I, I used to do door knocking and mm. stop people in the street and cold call. Oh, I mean, it's so effective, right? But yeah, it's not yeah. a it's not an accountant's personnel. <laughs> no. So, uh, and I, you know, I realised that I wasn't I was technical and clever, but I wasn't so much of the um, backroom accountant. I was more somebody that was able to think laterally, and that attracts business. So. Um, yeah, I grew the business and I had six staff and I got to the end of my degree, which I got while running the practice. So I was an unqualified accountant, but I had a BCom. And um, hmm. I applied for the Holy Grail, which was a big big four firm at that stage. They cut down to four firms. And um, I got offered a job on $18,000. Yeah. And I was already earning sort of $120,000. Know? <laughs> so I'm scratching my head thinking, I wonder if my dad's right. <laughs> um, and I sort of looked at it and thought, God, by the time I, I had my big four experience, um, I'll be back with six years' income. 
so I said to them, well, um, probably a bit ahead, ahead of other graduates, so I prepare financial statements and tax returns and I run an accounting practice. What should I do with my clients while I'm learning from you how to do this? And and they, <laughs> the partner there said, yes, it is a bit different um, and we're willing to give you an extra $2,000 <laughs> um, to, you know, to acknowledge this. Um, and he said, but what you should do is you should just give us all your clients and we'll just fold them in with our practice and then we'll teach you how to do this properly. Oh, that would have landed sweet. Well, you know, it's, it's like, <laughs> oh, I think this is a bit exploitive. So um, it's actually honestly the biggest decision I'd ever made. Yeah. Which was to ignore my dad's advice and take the path less trod and go straight into self-employment. So I've never had a job. Mm. Um, and, yeah, and that's what I did. And... So I thought, well, if I'm not going to get taught by these guys at the top end, um, I can hire them. You know, if I'm not going to go work for them, I can hire them. So I found a couple of guys that were industry leaders, and at the time they were four hundred dollars an hour, um, which was high back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would go in, I'd have a list of thirty questions, and I would just nail the questions, and mm. yeah, I self-taught using the top end of town. I probably spent twenty thousand dollars, but it was a whole lot cheaper than giving up my business and going mm. and working for someone on twenty grand. That's smart. I always look at it like you can mm. pay money or you can pay time. That's really smart. Yeah, yeah, and the business was flourishing too. Um, huh. The what the, did they say when you call them? Like, hey, teach me everything. I'll give you four hundred bucks now. Well, they were quite admiring of of somebody that had the balls to come huh. out of uni and back themselves like that, and they knew the story. Um, and I, I tell you what, I I worked out. Um, so uh, an area of expertise that our practice has that other firms don't have is we're asset planners. And I didn't particularly enjoy doing tax returns, so I hired people to do that. And I enjoyed doing advisory, and I was better at the law than the tax in my in my studies. Hmm. So what I realised is that when you go and ask an accountant, how should I structure myself? An accountant looks at tax and will arrange your affairs in the most tax-efficient manner. But what you really want is minimise tax plus good asset protection plus your estate set up uh, plus your relationship property stuff sorted out. Hmm. So if you get divorced, you don't want your tax plan to cause all of your wealth to be given away to a new spouse. If you die, you don't want your um, affairs to become tax inefficient or the money to go to a place you don't expect it to go. You don't want your wealth to become vulnerable to creditors. Um, if you get bankrupted, you don't want to lose all your wealth. So these are very important things to address in the process of planning how you own your assets. So I was early pioneer of this concept of asset planning. And what I did was I hired a um, couple of really good lawyers in this area and learned about asset protection hired the good tax guys, learned about tax, because I realised the best thing to do is to get the law and the tax to fit together. And if you go to an accountant, they give you a good tax-efficient outcome, but it's a disaster from an asset protection, estate planning, and that prop perspective, because they don't understand it. Mm. And if you go to a lawyer and ask them, they don't understand the tax, and so they give you a good legal outcome, uh, foul up the tax. So most clients will call the accountant and wait for them to liaise with the lawyer too hard, they speak different languages, they disagree on the approach because each of them have different divergent um, goals mm. and you just end up with poor structuring um, or very expensive processes getting lawyer and accountant to talk. Whereas our firm employs lawyers and accountants um, in the asset planning team. Anthony Lipscomb's our head of our tax team now. I used to be the head of it, um, but I, I saw this guy that appeared to be smarter than me, so... I hired him and it turned out he was. <laughs> so he now runs that team. He's a partner in the firm. Very, very clever man. He's hmm. been with us close to 20 years. So, yeah, good um, attention. Just absolute um, gold when it comes to tax and legal structures. Just on that, like the, mm. the two languages, because in financial planning, we would think about that, you know, how to structure assets, not so much in a company standpoint, but like, you know, and the change in legislation around trust and the yeah. complexity and new relationships. W what are you. What it was helpful for you to help them speak the same language? Was it you hired them so they already knew how to talk from an accountant to law? 
or what do you think is the gap between the, the you mean in terms of our employment or dealing with others well I, I mainly want to see the difference between industry thinking but using your employers as examples so you've got these law people that come in you've mm. got these tax people that come well, in. well actually we don't have legal and tax people that come in we instruct them and tell them to do as they're told Oh, yeah. So how how yeah. do we ensure not to fuck up? If an accountant's listening to this yeah. and they're failing their client in some oh, way. There's lots of accountants and lawyers that watch our, our um, continuing continuing education online. Oh, yeah. So we're peer-to-peer -peer as well. Okay. Um, so what I found is that everybody seeks to avoid liability and take no responsibility other than their narrow wedge of expertise. So they don't communicate. It's difficult, and when they when they are communicating, um, it, it's it's not easy for them because they don't speak each other's language, and their goals are almost mutually exclusive. Example: uh, It might be really tax efficient to run a partnership of two people because then they can split the income fifty fifty. So if somebody's earning four hundred grand a year and they want to pay their wife, uh, a partnership will give her half the income, and then the marginal tax rate applies to her at fifty percent on that, um, which is which is averaging down your income. Okay, so the thing about partnerships is they have joint and several liability. So each partner becomes 100% liable for the actions and obligations of the partnership. So you just, by structuring it that way, made a good tax move because you can income split to your spouse, but you made a terrible decision from a liability perspective because you made your spouse 100% liable for the actions or obligations of the business. So, okay... Good tax move, dumb legal move. Better move, run a company, give the spouse a share in the company, give the spouse a shareholder's salary. Don't make her a director if the if the non-working spouse is a she. Don't make them a director. Directorship equals liability. Something pretty silly I see is accountants and lawyers make the spouse a director. Just doubles the liability. Directors are the people responsible if something goes wrong. So there's no tax advantage in making the spouse a director. Don't make them a director. And then, and so that's a typical sort of an argument that you might have between accountant and lawyer. I want to run a partnership. Um, no, you should run a company. Okay, let's run a company. That's tax efficient too if we run a shareholder salary. But my wife wants to be a director. Does she? Does she want 100% of the obligation of the business? She's going to be liable as a director of the business. So this is where a good asset planner comes in and says, actually, actually, she wants the right to be a director, not the obligation of being a director. So give her the right in the shareholders' agreement to appoint herself later if she gets divorced and needs to, but don't make her director at the start or you just double the family liability. Hmm. And so there's a, there's a long-winded, simple example <laughs> of asset protection versus tax um, and how it's very easy to get that stuff wrong. And, and so there's a lot more to it, but somebody that really knows the stuff inside out can go through and, and, and get that stuff right. And then you get tax efficiency, really good asset protection, accountant and lawyer are happy. Mm. So we take that role. We will write letters of advice that instruct what we want the lawyer to do, the uh, mortgage broker to do, and the accountant to do. That's when we're dealing with other people's clients. And then... Because we've given a prescriptive list of things for our clients to do, it's someone's fault. Either we instructed it incorrectly or they didn't follow our instructions. And you think about the number of things that are going on here. If we're moving residential property, it's subject to bright line, um, it's subject to interest on deduction, so you can lose deductibility of interest. Uh, you can reset the bright line clock and it's taxable for 10 years, but currently it's not. Um, you, you know... It could be uh, an asset that was exposed to tainting, which is association to buying and selling property, which means it's taxable within 10 years. Oh, okay. So there's all of these complexities that we've mm. got to study the asset, look at the history of it, and then say, well, this is the right thing to do to it, to get the best asset protection, the best tax outcome, and that's got to fit into the estate plan and the relationship property plan. Oof. Yeah, and that's, and that's what we do. Yeah. yeah. And we do it for other firms, for their clients. We do it for our, our own clients. So once I've had that done, they migrate off into the accounting team where you've got the business services accountants that, that do all the traditional things that chartered accountants do, GST, income tax, year-end accounting. But they have that extra depth of understanding asset planning because they've been trained. 
and so they're they're alert to risk and mm. when they need that extra horsepower in our tax team are the lawyers and and uh asset planners mm. well what sort of a process let's say someone's trying to identify areas in their own plan mm. and a, a framework you go through to identify the correct information to find mm -hmm. and then also how you standardize that across 110 people like how do you get the right information if you're a person that doesn't have your help mm. and then how would you actually create that framework to make sure everyone's consistent in the advice they give I don't know it's a bit oh, you're talking about the business process of running GRA yeah I, I, I would tell you but I have to kill you oh dear <laughs> fuck you got IP damn it <laughs> I just love business eh, and how people do it uh, I mean you're exactly right so um, firstly you can't produce a letter of advice without a peer review mm. and the number of small firms that don't have someone to peer review their work um, is extensive in New Zealand because it's a there's so many kitchen table accountants or small law firms, they don't have a peer review. Hmm. So they do their best, but there's nothing like a second set of eyes that's been critical. So that's that's what our industry tells us we're supposed to do, and it's correct. You hmm. should not send advice without peer review. Uh, and so we do a fact find. We know what we're looking for, so we organise it in a in the way that we want to digest the information, which is a bit different to lawyers or accountants because we're looking both sides. Hmm. Um, and that involves digging into mat prop relationship property issues. Um, you know, example, you might have a husband and a wife who are second time around their relationship, and she's got kids to a prior partner. He's got kids through a prior partner, they're coming together and they're going to have kids together. So you've now got three layers of children in there and if you just have a standard you know, plan for your, for your practice for tax and legal structures, how does that fit in? Because hmm. that, that's a different situation to a couple with no kids getting together and, and having kids. They can share one trust. Mm. But if someone dies... yeah. The last, the last to die gets to choose which kids get the money. So one trust is not going to work. So um, also, what if they don't die? What if they just get divorced? What's in the mix and what's not? Who takes what at the end? So are they happy for everything to go 50-50? Or if, if there's a disparity of wealth, um, who should take that money um, and in what proportion? So you need to be upfront and transparent and very clear about this stuff and say, okay, this is what's normal. What would you like to do as the clients? Um, and that's, that can be quite confronting. It can, <laughs> can cause fights on the spot. <laughs> yeah. And it's not a romantic discussion. No, it's you know? not. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> um, I don't know what your question was. But no, no, yeah. no. Well, I was trying to get the secret sauce, but you gave an answer without giving the secret sauce. So that's good. It's reasonable. You know, tell <laughs> yeah. me exactly how you do it so we can copy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, I'll tell you what, um, I have had people ask me what the first step of planning for success is. Okay. And in the context of asset planning, here's some secret sauce. Oh, I can, man. Um, in, in the context of asset planning, the, the first step of planning for success is planning for failure. Mm. What would you do today if you knew that in 12 months' time you, you were going to go bankrupt? Hmm. everything was going to end in 12 months time. What would you do today? And the answer is you would do everything you can to protect the assets that you've amassed over your lifetime. You would do things like make sure that your home is in a trust. Make sure that the bank that's bankrupting you, if there's a bank involved, doesn't have a security over that asset. So you have separate banks, which means you've got separate trusts. And you would try and quarantine the liability down to a company hmm. so that the liability goes against the company not the shareholder trust or the family trust. The money that you're putting in your businesses, you would securitize it, meaning you'd put securities over the loans that you're putting into the companies so that when the company goes into liquidation, you're paid first ahead of everyone else. You get to appoint the receiver. And so when you plan for failure as your first step, hmm. you have a completely different mindset. And what the professional community do in New Zealand, and I suspect it's, it's everywhere in the world, um, what they do is they they pull a feather out and they tickle the issue. They're not serious about it. So they'll set up a trust and say there's asset protection. That's not asset protection. 
that's the start of a journey to locking down your assets. And if you said, actually, I'm going bankrupt next year, what can I do? You do everything you can to protect yourself. And that's our standard. Mm -hmm. So we really um, lock stuff down. And in the very rare situation where some of our clients tip over, and we've got a large practice, over 10,000 clients. Yeah. Um, when our clients actually go to the wall, um, we stand there with them. And I was telling you earlier, we do pre-insolvency planning where we can say, okay, well, we've got these structures in place. This is what's going to happen to you. You are going to go bankrupt, uh, but you're going to keep all the money. You're going to lose that bit over there because of the way we've structured it. So that's what I mean by when you set your when you when you set a plan for success in the asset planning world, plan to fail. That's step one. Then overlay the tax over the top of that. Hmm. Mm. Part of the failure you've got to plan for is death, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And also um, dissolution of relationship. Hmm. Yeah. Just on that relationship thing, because it, it seems to be judge to judge for what I've seen from the outside. Are you, are you finding best practice that's quite helpful? Because people get a trust, they don't run it right, they share the house, they don't have a separation, and then when they break up, the house is actually not protected by the trust in the way they thought? Well, you know, it's, it's situational and mm. it's um, individual circumstances because there's no generic answer. It's got to be case by case. Yeah, It's as simple as that. Um, but if you're not worried about sharing wealth, like I got together with my um, partner, at uni. Oh, yeah. Yeah, long time. Should um, give you ask relationship tips as well, mate. Like <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I might fail that test. But, um, you know, uh, everything I amassed, I, I, I was born in a trailer park pretty much. You know, my parents didn't have wealth. Um, so I've sort of fought my way out of the, the streets. Um, and I did it with her. So I don't need relationship property protection. And lots of people are in that situation where they say, well, we created it together. Mm. It's all 50-50, so it doesn't have to be that every structure has some mean-spirited attack on your on your partner, and that in many cases is, um, frankly, uh, inappropriate and not the right thing to do. But the flip side of that is some people get together late in life and they have a big disparity in wealth, and, you know, what I think is fair is you say, well, let's get a house together, and the contribution that one partner makes that exceeds the others, you might separate that off and all the other assets but say okay if I've got 10 million and you've got 1 million if I leave you um, I've got 10, 10 million more than than you um, 9 million more than you so I'll take my 9 and you take your 1 and anything we've created together that's in our joint affairs we'll share 50-50 so that's sort of the spirit of it where hmm. what you've created together and agreed will be joint um, will be shared and what is not agreed to be joint is separated out and you do that in the thing called a relationship property agreement you can do it as a prenuptial before the relationship forms or postnuptially if you're both on the same page and you just want to write it down mm -hmm. so it gets rid of that tension that could be between two people um, you can do that with lawyers it's, it's a section 21 agreement under the um, relationship property rules and you just um both parties take independent legal legal and accounting advice. The lawyers sign them off, and you write it down. Write down something that's fair and equitable, that's appropriate for the circumstances. Doesn't mm. doesn't have to be a mercurial attack on your partner. It's never romantic, <laughs> um, but you know it, it gets rid of that tension because uh, it can become a tension in a relationship. Well, I always I always wonder. It's like mm. worst best case scenario, only you die. You know. And every other person in your life is going to die at some point. You might see it and like life is suffering in some degree. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking like if you can't even chat to them, hey, if we break up, this is what we get. Your relationship's probably going to struggle at these key moments in life. You know what I mean? Like it's at least worth yeah, laying it out and talking. I don't know. You're, I'm, well, I'm the much, single man. It's much safer to do it at the beginning uh, because if there's any spite or anger uh, where, where there can be at the yeah. end, um, you know, it's much better to have your rights defined. So a relationship property agreement says it breaks into three parts. Schedule A, spouse one's agreed separate assets. Schedule B, spouse two's agreed assets. Schedule C, um, the joint assets. So this is joint. 
this is separate, mine, yours. And and then you need to refresh them every few years. Now, I'm not a relationship property lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but we facilitate this stuff. We say, okay, as part of the asset planning process, we're doing a plan for each asset. Whose asset is it? What do you agree? Right, go off to the lawyers. Here's some good nat prop lawyers. Document that stuff. It's part, it's, it's part of the process, an important part. But for many clients, it's not an important part. They don't even want it. So, mm. but you know, what you don't want is somebody that hasn't thought through the estate or relationship property as part of the process of planning asset protection, because it complete it can completely change what you do. How, how do you balance mm. between? I, I've heard that you should give people what they want before you give them what they need. But how do you navigate that? Like your advice is what's appropriate, but then they're not willing to take that advice. Like, do you try and think of how you communicate it, or do you, you know, because there's a consequence down the line. Like, you fucked me over, and you're like, no, I told you to do it, and you didn't do it. That's interesting. Um, well, pretty much we're best practice, so we're, but we can stage it for them. So we'll say to a client, look, a full blown asset plan requires you to move your 20 properties so that's twenty thousand dollars worth of conveyancing plus refinance uh and they might not want to refinance at the moment because they're not meeting servicing criteria so there's 20 grand just for the lawyer to um do half price conveyancing on a bulk deal so they might just say oh we don't want to do that it's the worst time of the market at the moment um so we might say to them look at the moment let's just bite this bit off Call that step one. Mm. And so our advice will say, step one, step two, step three, you can stage it out over time. But rather than giving them a small part of it and just say, do that, we will say, here's the big picture. So an asset plan to me is like a set of architectural plans for a house. Mm. And you don't build a house without house plans, do you? Don't try and build a technical uh, tax and legal structure without a, a plan for how you're going to do it that considers the tax ramifications, the legal ramifications thoroughly and actually um, instructs the people that are doing the work so they know exactly what's expected of them and why. Because that's another thing that you get in this in, in my business um, as a chartered accountant specialising in tax and legal structures. I get other, law f other accounting practices and law firms coming back saying, no, 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 um, we don't want to do it that way. We've got our own way of doing these things. And so you end up down these tunnels of we know best and it's so, okay, why are you doing that? We don't have to tell you what well, you do because your client's instructed us to run the process <laughs> and we can see what you're doing and why. You have good legal advice, but you're fouling up the tax. These are the tax issues. So we can end up in having quite expensive discussions with their advisors, broadening their perspective to realise that there's two sides to this and generally that we talk them around, they end up on our side of the fence. Hmm. Yeah. How did you how did you develop best practice over time? You know, because it seems like a dark art in some way. You know, like it's not dark; it's it's lateral. It's lateral. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's knowing both sides of it and saying, well, um, this profession wants this, this profession wants this. Let's get it to blend together mm. so that both parties. You you know, generally nine times out of ten, we can have a hundred percent asset protection, all the assets locked down nth degree an estate's a pretty generic thing f th that's easier relationship property generally pretty easy once you talk to the clients and then you build the tax around it and a few tweaks and you get the tax working as well so it's not that hard hmm. um, but if your perspective perspective is just one-sided it's not as good mm. yeah well i mean i've talked to a mm. lot of lawyers and accountants because you know they're a great referral source as mm. advisors and you, they don't really think like this. Uh, let, let's talk about your industry for a sec and oh, relate it to mine. So a insurance agent will always say, uh, I get two silly things out of your industry. They'll say trusts are not allowed to own um, life insurance policies. Okay. Which yeah. is just bullshit. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it, it's legalese. The trustees of the trust own the policy for the trust. So you're the, it's correct that you don't put the life insurance policy in the name of the Gilligan Family Trust, you mm. put it in the name of Matthew Gilligan and Rachel Gilligan as trustees of the Gilligan Family Trust. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so best practice is hold your life insurance in your trust, in the trustees' names. Um, why would you do that? It's because if Matthew Gilligan got noticed that he was being sued, had a heart attack and died, 
he doesn't want to have the life insurance flow into his hands because the creditors will sue his estate and get it. Uh, so that would be ridiculous. Yeah, Yet yeah. most life insurance agents put their clients' life insurance policies in their individual names. Hmm. So you bring in an asset planner like us and we would say, assign your policies to the trust and it's then safe in the trust. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it all revolves around this idea of you want to be poor, you want your trust to be rich. You want to control the asset, not own the asset. Mm. That's good asset protection. That's planning for failure. What would you do today if you knew that in 12 months' time you were going to go bankrupt and die? Yeah. <laughs> well, on the dying part, like uh, you said you had some thoughts on dying and, and, and how to structure things and fix things. Um, yeah, so what we say to clients is you you might set best practice structures up for yourself which would mean you own nothing you control everything you complete your gifting because any ungifted loan balances can be clawed out of the trusts you securitize all of your assets you segment your risks so you have different entities with different banks in them don't cross mingle your banks hmm. so i've even had clients that have um got um companies named after the banks so you can remember which company has which bank in it, you know, so he actually has the, the name of the bank backwards and the entity names. So, you know, ZBN is BNZ, you know. Uh, and so by siloing the bankers, you, um, you know, if the BNZ get upset with you, they take one entity down, not the whole group. Hmm. So, so siloing risk includes siloing banks. So you get all that stuff right. But when it comes to death, if you've set perfect structures up, who gets it and how do they get it? And if you have it all vest to your children, guess what? Your children have exactly the same issues you have. They grow up, borrow money, start businesses, make mistakes, go bankrupt. They die. They get married. So they've got estate planning um, and liability issues as well and tax issues. So what you want is to say, well, how should our very clever tax and legal structures we've set up with GRA, how should they be passed down to our kids? And it's the same stuff. You, you never want your wealth to go to your children's names individually, then their spouses can claim it, the creditors can get it. Hmm. So they should inherit via subtrusts out of your trust, your trust petition down oh, into separate trusts for them. Yeah. And by doing that, you're ring fencing the liability of those kids off um, from their creditors and spouses. Hmm. So, you know, um, when you have a philosophy around this stuff and you go and look at someone's affairs, others thinking about a good tax structure, we're looking at lots of other stuff. How do you inherit from your parents? How do you pass the money to your kids? How does relationship property affect this? Do you, If you've got a rich list parent and you've married, um, you know, um, for love, not money, <laughs> Um, you know, do you want that wealth coming through to seed into the other side? Yeah. Maybe you do. Maybe yeah. you do. It's your call as, as my client. Mm. But you got to think it through, right? And hmm. I said earlier, it's bespoke and it's individual. Um, and it needs to be bespoke. You've got to talk to everybody and say, what do you want? Hmm. And look at their circumstances. Mm. It makes sense. Do, do you... Does it get like over the top? Like, oh, I've got a grandkid, they're one, and then we silo it at a silo within the silo? No, because you can actually defer those structures being created to, to after death. Oh, like testamentary trust, huh? Is that well, what it's called? Um, you've, yeah, you've got inter vivis, um, which are correct, trust created during your lifetime, yeah, and, and testamentary trust, which will arise on death. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so you, with a trust, you have a document called a memorandum of wishes, and in that you can leave your instructions. Mm. So the instructions could be, hey, let's leave all the money to the kids individually. Um, that would not be best practice in our view. Instead, you'd say, please form subtrust for our kids and have them spawn out of our trust. Hmm. Um, but I, I said to you I wanted to talk about estate planning. I just remember why. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can't. Even though we're talking about estate planning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've gone off on a tangent. Um, one of the things that I'm really opposed to that I see in the... Uh, trust community in New Zealand mm. is a thing called gravy training, which okay. really disgusts me. Um, and that is where lawyers and accountants get control of your trusts after death. Oh. And they charge like wounded bulls. So I had one family that had two trusts. Their father died intestate. 
um, meaning without a will. Uh, he had law, he had lawyers in his trusts. It was quite a wealthy family. Um, and he, he died without a will. And normally you would specify in your will who the executor of the estate is. Oh, yeah. And the executor of the estate under most trusts will, will be the default power of appointment, the person who can hire and fire trustees. Oh. And so in the absence of specifying one, many trustees will just say, well, it's the trustees. So these two lawyers got in there and um, the trust didn't have that much wealth, maybe two and a half million dollars, which mm. in the world of trust is not that much. Um, <laughs> and anyway, by the time I um, started to get involved, one lawyer had spent 660 grand, the other had spent 460, mm. arguing over things that didn't need to be argued about. So the context of this was they had a company with losses that were arguably unable to be used, a couple of million dollars worth of losses, cash value 667, mm -hmm. 667,000. They spent over a million dollars trying to defend losses that you couldn't even use. And so I said to my clients, you don't need these guys. Like, we, can, we would have liquidated that company for 10 grand. There'd be no liability to the group you'd be done you know and i'd question whether you can even use those losses and see these guys spent over 1.1 million and they, they were just getting started so they were going to work their way through all of the cash in there so uh, my client wrote to them and asked them to resign they said no your father appointed us with good reason um we have a duty of loyalty to the set law he wanted us to do this <laughs> so this is gravy training right? Like, firstly, your advice is incompetent, these guys. Are, they spent 1.1 chasing cash value of 667, and it was dodgy whether you could even use the losses. There's just no commerciality in that. So when one of the lawyers then wrote back and said, I won't resign as your um, trustee uh, for the following reasons, sent 10 pages of case law and sent my bill for eight grand to say no. <laughs> Gravy training. Yeah, yeah, This yeah. disgusts me. Yeah, yeah, geez. So what you want to do, ex clients with existing trusts, is go through your trust deeds and your estate, because the two relate together, and make sure that after death, it's not lawyers and accountants, it's your kids. Because ultimately your kids are the beneficiaries, and if they're competent and of age, they should be running the trusts. They should work together and sort this stuff out. In most circumstances, there's always exceptions to the law. But don't put your lawyers and accountants in there. It's not the right thing to do. And they'll charge like wounded bulls. They, the bar on them is very high. If they make a mistake, they're going to get sued. So they're going to pay attention. They're going to charge you five, six hundred bucks an hour mm. to do anything, to write a check to, to a beneficiary for $200. They'll charge you 500 bucks. So do you want that? Um, <laughs> it's mad. Yeah. And so if you're not going to have your lawyers and accountants, who's it going to be? Is it going to be your brother-in-law, your sister? Mm. Um, is it going to be the kids? And, and when the money goes down to the kids, I have a, a view around this about, about timing. I think that kids should get their inheritance at 30. It's a good default number. Because part of your financial education actually is being poor in your 20s. You learn the value of capital. You learn the difference between return on capital and capital. You know, you eat the fruit off the tree, not the tree. So you give you give a twenty one year old um, two million dollars. What do they do with two million dollars? It actually ruins them. Mm. Uh, the first thing they do is leave university because they're rich. They don't have to try anymore. They or they fire their boss. I've seen that in the client base. You know, they they become arrogant and they don't need their boss anymore. You're fired, and then off they go, and they start living off capital because the return off two million dollars is not going to keep them alive. So the capital gets whittled away and they turn 30 nine years later and there's no money left. And they've kind of missed that formative age of educating and working their way up through organisations. So you wreck your kids. So I say make your kids poor in their 20s. If you're alive and everything's well, you might give them a 20% deposit on a house and guide them to stay in school and go to uni or get a trade and become successful in that business and give them seed capital to get them going. But if you give it all to them in one hit, young, I think you spoil them. So that is something where hmm. if 
you die young, you want to pass that down to your kids through your estate planning. And that's where a generic estate plan is not good enough. You need somebody who's a bit commercial and a bit real, I guess, a bit human, that recognises human flaws and traits and what you do as a parent and puts that into your estate for you. That's something we do, it's just generic in the way we approach. Now, look, some kids are born sensible. I've got a son who's born sensible. I try and shake him up and make him a bit looser every now and again. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he makes me laugh. He um, he's, he's very compliant. He'll make a great accountant or, or a terrible one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one or the other. He, he's, and so he's the exception to the rule. I'd give him his inheritance younger because uh, he's not going to go and buy a Lamborghini. Mm. But some kids, 30 is too young, you know. Uh, I've had clients say to me, geez, my son's 45, he's still too young to get, get an inheritance. So it's all bespoke, it's client by client and what they want. Yeah. But that's that's some good philosophy around estate planning. Well, I think it, it's, it's mm. so important. I think of any attribute you have that you admire, like resilience, it's like you need to suffer in order to get the resilience. Yeah. Like you need patience, you need to wait. So you're taking that away from them. That's the um, that's the Catholic principle of delayed gratification. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not where I got it from. If yeah, that, that is. Yeah, I'm not a Catholic, but I, <laughs> yeah, you didn't strike me as but one. I, but. but I was born in a Catholic household. Yeah. Oh, good. You just read off some Bible quotes. Yeah, yeah no, not that much. <laughs> <laughs> what would be? So I got thrown out of Sunday school actually. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah you have a rebel like streak. Kissing, kissing, kissing. Yeah, I was I was not allowed back. Thankfully. Did you get the cane? You know, I was pretty good at avoiding responsibility for my actions at school. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty quick off the mark. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, just on the intergenerational wealth side of things, because you, you know, you didn't, you came from not much, and then now you've yeah. got it. Now you've got kids, and you're like shit. Yeah. You know, I don't want to spoil their lives by giving them too much. How how do you balance as a father, helping them develop character while also you know caring for them? It's actually a good question because. Um, you know, I, I talk tough um, about, you know, starving your kids so that they learn the value of capital. But it's a really hard thing to do because you love your kids. Mm. Um, you have a daughter as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's, is that harder? Or is it the same? It's the same. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you a terrible story of parenting failure here. <laughs> so um, I bought my kids rental properties. So I'm a property guy. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I own a fair bit of property. Um for social housing and, and our culture and our practice is look at what we do, copy what we do, get what we get, which is really in your face because <laughs> we're transparent. Look, I bought this, I did this to it, I sold it, I made this much money. <laughs> or I bought this, it revalued at that, I made this much money. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in New Zealand, we have this um, very, quite envy based view of the world where we're supposed to hide what we do and pretend we're not successful. And if you're too successful, um, the tall poppy machine comes up and starts to take a swing at you, doesn't it? Mm. And it's I, I don't like that. Um, I get great pleasure from seeing my clients succeed. Um, and if I help them do it, um, that makes me feel really good. Uh, and so we pass that to our clients and I pass that to my kids. So um, my son was 15 and he'd been coming to rental um potential rental investments with me oh, 15 yeah uh, really good because yeah, yeah. he he would go into the houses and he'd say dad how the hell do people live like this you know they don't do their dishes they don't make their beds there's shit everywhere in the house it's filthy i'm like oh do you appreciate your mother now you? <laughs> you know so it gave him an appreciation of of yeah. how the rest of the world lives but we he would then stand at auctions with me and we would do um, we would do math, so I'd say, okay, what's the end value of this in the suburb renovated? So, he, and he'd work with me in the suburb, and he'd say, oh, well, it might be worth seven hundred thousand. Mm. Okay, what's the reno going to cost? Eighty grand. Um, so seven hundred minus eighty is six twenty. Um, how much do we want to make? Twenty percent on seven hundred, one forty. So six twenty minus one forty, four eighty. That's our max bid. If we pay four eighty, spend one forty, uh, um, sorry, spend four eighty, spend eighty grand on the Reno, we're going to make one hundred and forty thousand dollars. So that's the that's the max bid approach. Mm. Start at the end, 
take off the renovation cost, take off the profit you want to make. Um, that adds to 220. 700 minus 220, that's the maximum you can bid to spend 80 and make 140. So I've got my kids doing this. Um, and so I bought him his first one. We, we went to the auction, we bought him a house. Um, what, what, 15? Yeah. If I argue to trigger so many people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, God. So I mean, it's an asset that accumulates and it's making him money and he's learning things on how well, to build it. I could Probably go, better than a car, that's for sure. Yeah, so he's responsible for it. And yeah. So, um, Is he in a sub-trust, is that what it's Yeah, so uh, I set him up a trust, set him up a company under a trust. So I get home and my daughter, she's nine, She's furious about this. Oh, <laughs> she doesn't have a house. Starts crying. Ah, how come he gets his first house and I don't get one? So I'm like, oh, I oh, know this is this is just ridiculous, right? Now. Um, so I bought another one, yeah, and yeah, I did two, yeah, yeah. And now, um, that's like four years ago. Those assets are up fifty percent, yeah. And I put them both together and said to my son, um, "You're managing that portfolio for your sister." Okay, so why did I do this? Well, firstly, they both made two, three hundred grand on the way into the transactions. <laughs> Because while we were renovating, the market was um, going good. was rising rapidly. Yeah. And since then, it's gone up further. Mm -hmm. So they've had the capital growth. They've got income off these assets going through to their company. In 10 years' time, when it comes time for them to buy a house, they sell. The assets should be up 60%, 70% more. They sell to go and buy a family home. So that's how you turn a scungy rental property in a marginal area into a family home for one of your kids. And you get them to participate in the whole process. It's a life lesson. And I gave them a deposit for the properties, which is extra equity in it. So, so they're set up, right? Mm. So it feels good as a dad to do that. And I think everybody should do that for their kids. And anybody can do this. It's not rocket science. Mm. Hmm. So, but, uh, yeah, but, but <laughs> it is quite funny, right? Just buy a rental for you, you know? But, but it's quite funny because... <laughs> Same um, thing, yeah. You know, it's ridiculous that your nine-year-old daughter's demanding a house because her brother got one, um, and that isn't that is entitlement and privilege. Um, maybe it is, but it's it's a better way to raise them than to just give me us. It's to say to them, well, you're going to do the renos, and you're going to make your own wealth. You're teaching them money. You're teaching them how to be landlords young, mm. and as they get older, I've got fifty-seven rental properties with. Um, various JVs, but mainly one of the partners at GRA, Celeste Chand, he and I um, do a lot of social housing. And, and we were doing that before the interest on deductions came in. Uh, so we've amassed a really good portfolio over the years. And, you know, all of that rental stock is leased to the government, guaranteed income, automatic rental increases. Mm. We... Um, we're very low repairs and maintenance bills because the tenant pays the damage that they do, which is a misnomer. People look at, we're going off into property now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People look at social housing as a, um, a huge liability and think that it's really troublesome because of the tenants. It depends on how you do it. If you contract with the tenant directly, they're terrible. They'll wreck your house and run away and they can't pay for the damage they've done. But if you deal directly with the government and then they subtenant to the tenant, they have to pay the damage. We've got some amazing stories around what the tenants have done to the government in our houses. Um, like case in point, we had one in Manurewa, brand new five bedroom house that we built, block a, a brick property. Um, beautiful, is it Ashcroft Holmes house? Um, excellent house, brand new, give it to the government. The government say to the tenant, we're going to give you a 90% rental subsidy. You've got to pay 10%, which is like 60 bucks a week. The tenant gets three months in arrears on their $60 a week oh. in this brand new house. Yeah, yeah. Good so, deal. So social housing say, well, you've got to get out. We're giving you notice. Tenant's furious. Wreck the house. Smash all the walls in um, and uh, destroy the carpet and move out. So good on your tenant. You've had a beautiful new house, high spec, AC, everything that most most families would would um, aspire to get. They've mm. had it given to them for ten percent rent, mm. and then they don't pay it and they wreck the place to leave. So this is the, I guess the 
some of the inequity that comes out of society when you're trying to help people. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get some stories, I'm sure. So they, they get out, the social housing company then say, look, we're a bit embarrassed. Our tenants wrecked your brand new house. <laughs> and we're like, well, we don't care because you're paying rent anyway. Uh, um, so no problem. Do what you need to do to fix it. So they hire some people to come in hmm. and and repair it. And when the painters are there, they've got these 10 litre pots of paint in the property. And they leave the doors unlocked over the weekend. Some street kids come in and think, oh, this is a good opportunity to have some fun. And they throw the paint over all the walls, all the tiles. And then one of them goes upstairs, tips it down the drain so that it goes through the slab and sets solid in the plumbing in the slab. <laughs> And they smash all the walls again. They've just been gypped, smash the windows. So you'd think, okay, this is about the worst investment you could have. <laughs> yeah. But is it? Because actually, we're being paid full rent all the way through, and they just paid to fix it. Yeah. So our repairs and maintenance bill is zero, mm. and our vacancy rate is zero. Yeah. And the tenant really appreciates the fact that we don't get upset about it. Because huh. it's an investment. We're, we're not... Um, you know, we're not offended by it. It's just a business. It, it's it's numbers in a balance sheet and a profit and loss statement. And the more of these things you get, and then you apply seventy percent capital growth over ten years, being conservative, uh, the wealthier you get. <laughs> so we preach this to our clients, and we've we've got so many examples. Um, I invest in Christchurch at the moment. I've been doing EQC rebuilds down there. So as is houses, or Cantabs listening. We'll know all about that stuff. So I did um, 52 um, EQC houses. Um, where And as his house is a house that's earthquake condemned, oh, but yeah. it can be repaired. Oh. Yeah, so it's a thing. Like when you get into property, there are all of these niches that you can work in. Subdivisions, buying sections and building, homes and incomes, multiple income stream properties. Common theme is when you buy a property, you want to make money when you buy it. Um, and so that instant equity that you get when you buy a property at the beginning is the wealth you make as you buy. And if you're not getting that, if you're just buying retail, you're, you're failing. That's not how property investment's done. You've got to make money on the way in. Um, interesting to talk about fund managers' view of this stuff because <laughs> yeah, um, we'll, 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 do that, we'll do that next. But we're talking about making money out of property. You get instant equity when you buy a property. And, and by example, as is houses... Uh, earthquake uh, condemned houses that you fix, get a new CC, CCC for, then you do a cosmetic renovation and then sell them back or put them in your portfolio. So, so I set up a business doing this in Canterbury with a um, mate of mine down there and we did 52. Um, and it was real mix, like low end to, to high end. Um, we like the top one down there. We sold for close to four million, but most of them were sort of five to seven hundred thousand, which is entry level in Christchurch. So we'd buy, renovate, CCC, sell back, and I have this I this um, principle where I tend to trade two, hold one. Why would I do that? No idea. I'm just listening. So, so I'm, I'm starting so, to to do your head and auto because you've just listened to me on tax. No, no, I, I, I'm learning. I know nothing about property. Never owned one. Never thought about. It, no interest. So okay. that's why I'm just listing. Oh yeah, you you have these niches within it that you can capture when you go on and you yeah. buy something. There's yeah. you want to make money. I'm yeah. listening. I just know nothing. I would. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. But um, so Two every everybody runs out of equity. Doesn't matter how rich you are. Mm. Once you get more houses and more things on the go, you run out of money. So in the property game, generally you're going to make the most money in New Zealand by buying something and holding it for a long time because tax-free capital gains. We yeah. don't have capital gains tax. We do have Brightline, currently 10 years, going back presumably to two years under the national government who have promised to reduce Brightline to two years. Hmm. Um, so, okay, no problem for me because I hold all my properties long-term, 10 years plus. So you buy something for a million bucks with three houses and three income streams coming in, you're getting cash flow, you make 30% on the way in, you make 300 grand on the way in, and then it goes up 70% over the long term, and generally 100%, but I'm saying 70 um, 
percent to be conservative. Mm-hmm. Capital growth rates on property 100 percent in almost everywhere in New Zealand mm. um, over 10 year periods from 87, 97, 2007, 2017. It's gone up 100 mm. percent for every one of those 10 year cycles. Uh, those are the peak peak periods. So if you want that 100 percent, you buy um, a portfolio of assets, you get 100 percent growth. It's tax free. So when you buy them, you get instant equity on the way in, you hold them for cash flow, that's positive cash flow coming in, which pays the debt down, mm-hmm. and rents go up over time, so that gets better and better, and then at the end you get a tax-free gain. Um, so that's the property gain. Take it down to Christchurch. Mm-hmm. The niche I was dealing in was as is houses, buying earthquake um, broken houses, fix them, revalue them, we're making 30%. And if you sell two, you pay tax on the two you sell, and then you take the money you made and you put it as a deposit on the one that you keep. So if you've made enough that you make 30% on the way in, plus the deposit on the first two that you sold, you end up sort of 50, 45% LVR, and so you're very safe and you're very positive cash flow. So you can build a large positive cash flow portfolio that's going to pay you cash for the rest of your life it's going to double in value over 10 years, that you make 30% on the way in, plus we get trading income. That's what I was up to down there. So this is 101 property stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, and anybody in the property circles knows this stuff. Yeah, some are really explaining it. Some are really good at it. Some are not good at it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up with 16 houses down there um, in, in my portfolio that I own 50-50 with my mate Pete. In, in Auckland, we've got a lot of... Um, social housing and in Rotorua we've been land banking down there we've got 35 um, thousand meter sections in Mm. Rotorua why would we do that because there's a shortage of of supply in Rotorua and we saw that they were putting all the emergency housing into the motels and we thought it will come a day that um, a government will say this is not the way to go we need that for for tourism and it's not good for the street appeal and the curbside appeal of Rotorua to have all of these homeless people um, lying all over the footpath out the front on the main street they're going to they're going to want to undo that hmm. so we've been buying developable blocks hmm. um, waiting for plan change nine to come through another conversation but what's happening with the zoning of property through New Zealand is they are emulating what Auckland did with the Auckland Unitary Plan. Do you, do you know about the Auckland Unitary Plan? <laughs> Property zoning? Huh? It's, it's going to be a long podcast. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, but, you know, if people are listening and you're, you're educating them too, not just me. And there will also be experts be like, come on, mate, chop through. Yeah. So. <laughs> you're at 58 minutes. So I've got time. Okay. I think I've done a lot in 58 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so the... New Zealand, when you get short of housing supply, you see it because rents go up, applications far exceed the amount of stock. It's yeah. happening in Auckland again at the moment, by the way. Yeah. End of 2023, there's a shortage of rental supply. Hmm. And it takes a while for that to build into an increase in property values because there's always a lag. Hmm. And you need the increase in property values to come up to justify the investment uh, to meet the demand. So this was a big lag, two years. Hmm. And in some areas in New Zealand, they have what I describe as arcane zoning ideas where they think that everybody should have a 700 metre big backyard and a small house on the front or in the middle and your kids run around. That's arcane. It's not how the world works these days. Because hmm. the value of the land is, is so high that the, the single dwelling sitting on, say, $600,000 worth of land means it's 600 plus the build cost. It's one, one, two, one point two million dollars $1.2 million for an average house. And average people can't afford that. Mm. So what zoning seeks to do in 2023 is take that piece of land and let you put medium or high density on it. Divide the land cost into 10 units, the average cost of, of a piece of land in 10 units that costs 600000 is now 60000 per unit. Oh, yeah. So you dilute the loss, cost of land down. Mm-hmm. And, and so Auckland did this really well with the unitary plan. And uh, Labor, Megan Woods, got together with um, 
the national government when they're in opposition in 2021 and said we've got to spread the unitary plan across New Zealand and allow densification in areas that are in the greatest need. So they went through areas like Wangarei, Auckland, um, Hamilton, Tauranga, Wellington, Rotorua, hmm. um, and uh, um, Queenstown Lakes District, where there's chronic shortages of housing. And they said, well, let's take the Auckland lessons that have worked really well and spread them across the country. That was NDRS, Median Density Residential Standards. And they imposed them on those areas and said, this is mandatory. Councils must adopt this in their district plan. Hmm. So it's very controversial. Yeah. And they did a really bad job of it because um, Auckland, Auckland notified the unitary plan in 2013. It operated in 2016. They took three years. And then after that, it took a couple of years for the finer points to be worked out. It was a five-year um, process. But Megan Woods and, um, and National were very arrogant about this. They didn't consult. They just said, oh, we'll just take the Auckland model make it denser and slam it into these areas. Oh. Uh, it's terrible because you, you end up with, for example, if you live on a slope and that's that's the land and here's your view, if you suddenly let this guy in the middle who's got a single level house put a five-storey building there, everybody above that person loses their view. You destroy their capital rights. So they all go berserk and they either build a six-storey building so they can get a peek over uh, or they, they have their capital destroyed. Mm. And so they had um, they had zoning in ordinary suburbs that, were, that would allow you to go four, one meter off the boundary, four and a half meters and forty five, which just shades the neighbour and kills their views. Horrible, hmm. three levels, uh, eleven meters. So the government slams this stuff through. There's been a big pushback, and it's settling less dense. National's going to dial it back. It's the right idea. It's the wrong ex- execution, but. Back on point, there's a lot of money in this. Mm -hmm. Because if you're sitting on developable blocks, if you know what a developable block looks like, you want a rectangular site, 20 metres, adjacent to services. Hopefully it's got a transformer within 50 metres so that there's plenty of power. Services around, so supply of water, stormwater, sewer, all that stuff you want if you're a developer. Buy sites that are adjacent to that stuff that are the right shape, in the right areas, close to transport, then you can take those people off the off the um, Fenton Street in, in Rotorua and say, come and live in our high-density blocks that we're building for you. That's our idea. So we've got 35 of them lined up. And mm. we just, um, yeah. And, and that's where strategy and reading the market and reading what's going on is really important in property. Because there's a little picture, how do I subdivide and build and make money? There's a big picture, what's going on in the area and why would you back that area? It seems like there's quite a variation in the niches that you target. I'm wondering if there's some sort of semblance of framework. Like, for example, Christchurch, you've got the earthquake. Mm. And then Rotorua, you've got the land banking and for the opportunity for the high-density zones. I mean, you can do that anywhere. Tauranga at the moment is great for that. Tauranga is starving for supply. Mm. NDRS is going to be huge down there. They've got to sort their infrastructure out, though. Their, their um, traffic is atrocious and they, they don't have enough stormwater and services in the ground hmm. but but all, all of the areas that are going through rezone will face this issue and there'll be a big lag and and what i would say to uh, my clients and the listeners is first cab off the rank gets to benefit so if you're first to do it in the street you might use up the sewer capacity and the power capacity next developer comes along they have to upgrade it all so you've got to be quick hmm. mm. Oh, interesting. So, so you don't like, even though you're using all the sewer, some old mate comes in, they have to pay for it to get more sewer for them. Well, in New Zealand, we have this ridiculous system where if there's no capacity, the next developer has to pay for all of it. Oh, it's, it's ludicrous. In right. Australia, they set up a fund, yeah, and they'll say, Well, there's 5,000 people in the catchment that's going to use this network, we'll charge you one five thousandth plus some interest, and they'll put the whole network in. So the Aussies are really good at this. New Zealand's terrible. I've talked huh. to I've talked to David Seymour about this, and said you need to fix this. What what sort of clients like reach out to you? Like who who actually wants the support and who can afford the support? Uh, well, look, firstly, you don't get me. You get the team. Uh, we have a property advisory team. We have the asset planners, tax and legal guys. Um, we employ lawyers and and accountants in that team, and then we have the business business advisory team, who look after normal businesses and the property advisory stuff. So 
it's three three teams um, and we have a real mixed bag of clients so we'll be right down to people buying their first home how do we do that what sort of structure hmm. to people buying their first investment property and we've filmed podcasts like this Celeste runs them every month showing entry level deals that we do it's our culture look at what we do copy what we do get what we get um, there's a lot that I haven't talked about um, that we've done it's all on our podcasts um, at GRA so if you get onto gra.co.nz you'll see we've got a lot of free videos on there on tax and legal structures on different property deals we've been doing um, and we've got a school a property school uh, which is a seven week course it's cheap as chips $700 I think we've got a property development school using examples of developments we've we've done step by step how to cost it um, how to do feasibilities how to take advantage of zoning all, all the stuff that I've been rabbiting on about here so we you know now our, our um, client base literally extends from mum and dad's getting going to media net worth people who are already going who want to go faster or do better at what they're doing through to very high net worth people um, that that want to a hand with their property stuff and their tax and legal structures so it's real mixed bag and we give bespoke solutions every client's bespoke and we tailor it to what they're trying to do bomb mm. all right well thanks for coming on pleasure thanks for having me <laughs> no worries see you again <laughs>